Good morning. All right, how many of y'all had turkey this week? All right, how many of y'all saw family this, that you don't normally see this week? All right, well, I want you to know this morning we are starting off worship with a beautiful celebration. And I like the word celebration where we are celebrating the fact you've got a new brother in Christ. Now, to be honest, as he comes down this morning, he made his decision for Christ years ago. But it, today we are just going to, he is taking this bold step of obedience. And I can think of no greater way to start a worship service than to proclaim to the world that we are life changed people. And that is an amazing thing. So if you are glad you're here this morning, would you just say amen? Amen. amen. All right. I want to introduce to you one of your brothers in Christ. Seth, would you come on down? Yeah, Steve said he turned the heat on. We're not really sure. Uh, That's cool. <laughs> All right, can you see him? Tell you what, for just a minute, I'll put you back down on the floor, but just stand up there as I introduce you and talk to you for just a sec. Shiver a little bit, okay? Seth came years ago. Actually, I believe it was under uh, Pastor Chris. And the wonderful celebration of his life transformation, is it's a lifelong process. But just recently he came and says he wants to be baptized and proclaim to the world what God has already done. Uh, we celebrate with him the fact that this is a moment of obedience in Christ. And it is something that each of us as God's children should follow. So I want to ask a question first to you, Seth. Have you come to a place where you know what Jesus has done for you and that he is your Lord and Savior? Yes, okay. Don't tell me. Tell them. Yes. <laughs> All right. If, uh, now you can step down and face that way. And this is what we're going to do. It is oh, nip. Yeah, it is cold. And you're going to get really cold in just a second. Oh, where's when it gets up to the waist? <laughs> <laughs> if, this is what I want to do. If you are part of Seth's family or you've been in a ministry that has ministered to him along his journey, would you stand while he's baptized just to acknowledge and say, we stand with you? Our brother in Christ. They're here for you, bro. So, cross your arms. There you go. There, just cross. There you go. Upon your public profession of faith and upon your obedience to Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my brother Seth, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> that wasn't so bad. <laughs> Now, if you are a member of his family and you sing, would you come forward? <laughs> uh, which is why the brother stays wherever he is. So. And if you're a, fr a family, a friend of the family too, we have one. That's, uh, we are here to worship today and we are excited. Anna came home for the holiday as well, but she's going to be part of this. Uh, if you are a guest with us, we welcome you and we'll do that officially in a minute. But this is most of the elder family that is Seth's older sisters and parents. So we are excited. Would you stand as we start our singing with a great song that talks about baptism? It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. And I woke up this morning and I, and I realized 30 years ago, ago today, I was baptized at Falling River Baptist Church. And so it's, it's never too late, and we just celebrate in this. Uh, Seth wanted to go down to Rocks, and, uh, but he would have had to wait to spring thaw down there. So uh, we're going to do the hypothetical river and join with us in singing this song. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Come on, brothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. 
as I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way and to show where a starry crowd, good Lord, show me the way. Fathers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, fathers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, mothers, let's go down, let's go down, don't you want to go down? Come on, mothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Good Lord, show me the way. Good morning. Welcome this morning to Evergreen Baptist Church. Um, everybody should be smiling and excited. There is a baptism that just happened, and if that doesn't excite you, nothing will. There's some ministry opportunities this week. Today, starting at 2 o'clock, and maybe tomorrow if we need it, we're decorating the church for Christmas. And so show up for that at 2 p.m. today. This Wednesday night, 7 p.m., the Ball Brothers will be here as a partnership with Bible Baptist Church and, and this church. And uh, speaking of that, if you can help me park cars on Wednesday night, meet me down here for about five minutes right after the, uh, the church uh, to this afternoon. Lottie Moon Missions Offering. We have a goal we've set at this church for $3,000. We're about a third of the way there. In order to help that, we have the Christmas card exchange again this year in the lobby. It starts uh, this week. Take your Christmas card. Put it out there in the, in the box and take the postage and give that postage to Lottie Moon and, and we'll deliver that card for you. And if you're struggling this season at Christmas, like we know some folks are, our pastor and our benevolence ministry would like to help you. And they'd like to do that discreetly and practically, confidentially. Maybe you're a parent who needs a little bit more for this season uh, to help your children. Uh, pastor Todd, reach out to him and he will talk with you. That's all confidential as well. And let's pray as we begin this service this morning. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this Sunday, that we can come into your house and worship. Father, we ask that you help us to put away all distractions and, and all hindrances and things, and, and we can just focus solely on you. Lord, we, we thank you for this uh, church service, and we ask that everything that is done here is pleasing in your sight. And Father, we just pray this morning that if one person doesn't have a relationship with you, doesn't know you as their Savior. Father, that we're here for that reason, that they will come to that saving grace, that they will come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Father, we pray this morning for the message that you, are, you have given to Pastor Todd, and we just ask that you would allow our hearts to be open and our minds and, and ears to hear that and not just hear him as he preaches but take it out and be doers of your word Lord we thank you for all that you have done for us all that you are doing right at this moment and all you will do for us in the future so in your son's name we make this prayer amen I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God disclosed 
as we tarry there, none other has ever
It's okay to be smiling. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away When the shadows of this life have gone I'll fly away Like a bird from prison bars have flown I'll fly away I'll fly away, oh glory I'll fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. And this last one is, um, was one of David's grandma, our great-grandma Bridie's favorites, and it makes me think about... Um, Pastor Todd asked us to do something that was uh, talking about dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. And we get so bound up and ruffled by our circumstances. And in Philippians, Paul talks about, I, I know what it's like to have a lot. I know what it's like to have very little. But I, he's learned the secret of being content. And that secret is looking at things through eternal perspective. No matter how large our home or small, our home might be here. It pales in comparison to the heavenly home that God has for us, that mansion over the hilltop. So let's just sing like we believe that we are going to that mansion over the hilltop. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below. A little silver and a little gold But in that city where the ransom will shine I want a gold one that silver lined I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old and someday yonder we'll never more wander but walk the streets that are purest gold though often tempted tormented and tested and like the prophet, my pillow's a stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. In that bright land where we'll never grow old And someday yonder we'll never more wander But walk the streets that are 
purest gold Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely I'm not discouraged I'm heaven bound I'm but a pilgrim in search of a city I want a mansion a harp and a crown I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old and someday yonder we'll never more wander but walk the streets that are purest gold I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old and someday yonder we'll never more wander but walk the streets that are purest gold but walk the streets that are purest gold give honor to God for what he's going to do for us. Amen. You may be seated. Unless you are a kid, then I've just got a couple of words. Get out. Okay, it is time for our, we have a children's church over there, and it's exciting that we have that ministry, and, uh, and I know that uh, it's not just for the kids. It also helps the parents to a little bit of adapt and, and uh, kind of just stay uh, focused in all that's going on. If you got your Bibles, would you open with me one last week to Psalm 23? It'll not be the last time I ever go to Psalm 23, but this does is ninth of tenth of our last series. We started a little over two months ago, and this has been a wonderful challenge to me personally, and I hope to you as well. It is uh, the first Sunday of Advent, and it feels weird because just like. 48 hours ago, we were still, you know, doing Thanksgiving and watching the Cowboys lose and, and all that's going on. Uh, I did get out and purchase a tree. This is not one of Gene's trees. This is, this is actually live, uh, but it kind of goes with the Advent, and it is going to be part of the sermon in just a minute, but it is a reminder. I encourage you, be back here around two if you can, or three or four, whenever you can show up. Underneath me, when I first got to this church, they told me underneath me is a trap door, uh, but, but I didn't believe them. So I looked, and it's not. Uh, underneath me are Christmas trees and decorations, and we, it's going to take some uh, agile, young-blooded people to get under there and start pulling that stuff out. It's going to be, and then we kind of get all ready. We want to be completely decked out by December 1st when the Ball Brothers get here, so I'm encouraged about that. But with all that said... The first Sunday of Advent is the concept of hope. And the songs that we have sung, the picture of baptism is a picture of hope. It is a picture of what God has done in our lives and the beauty of we have been buried with Christ and raised to walk. And then last week in Psalm 23, 6, the first half of the verse, it said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. But literally, we showed it doesn't say follow, it says pursue or chase us. It's like the sheepdog behind us that are chasing us into the final resting place. And it is goodness and mercy that chase us. And no matter where we go in this life, we may go down the wrong path, the good path, the right journey. If we are God's children, if we are part of his flock, that goodness and mercy will constantly pursue us. Now, here is the segue into Advent. Goodness and mercy is fine. I could say it, and you might even understand what it means. You might say, goodness, that God treats me okay. But um, this is a little, off, a little off my mouth. And, uh, but goodness and mercy actually became personified in a person named Jesus. He is good. He brings 
mercy. And it's not just like this, this subtle, you know, spiritual goodness and mercy that we can talk about. It is literally God pursued us so much that his goodness and mercy became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about all the hope that they anticipated, the expectation of what will heaven be like as I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, as Psalm 23, 6, the second part talks about it. in other places, what will it be like? We talk with great expectations. We can know with certainty because the goodness and mercy became flesh and provided the way. So as I look to the concept of hope that I'll fly away, the concept that I have a mansion or a place over a hilltop, I look with confidence because the first advent means that he said he would come. He did. So when he said he'll come again, he will. And I want you to know, I hope you can live with that confidence. So as we look at the end of this passage, and the end of this great psalm, it started out with, the Lord is my shepherd. A joyous acclamation of, wow, imagine what it means. It's scary. It means I got a shepherd that I'm not going to get away with anything. I got a shepherd that understands me completely. I got a shepherd that no matter what I'm going through, he is there. His rod and staff will protect me from anything that this world can throw at me. Even if I walk through that deep, dark valley, this is that great God whose rod and staff protect me, and he always is with me. Lush valleys, beautiful tables spread before me. God is there. And the hope that we have is because of his great shepherding. So he came. The Lord is my shepherd. It starts off with that acclamation, and the psalm ends with this phrase. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Look at the bookends. He's my shepherd. And if, even if nothing else happened between verse 1 and verse 6, we've got this. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I want us to just be challenged and encouraged today. So let me first tell you sheep talk, all right? What is I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever? And the next slide is going to be this picture of a gate. The, imagine that we have talked. We've gone to the lush valleys. We've been on the table where he's the table before us and the, and the mountains, the deep, dark valleys and the canyons. And now we're coming back and the, the calm streams. But now winter is coming back. The end of the season is coming and he brings us back home. And the sheep are being brought back. And there is the security that we're going home to where the shepherd lives. He's not going to abandon us. He's not going to leave us out in the wilderness. He's not going to say, it's too cold for me. The sheep can stay. No, he brings us home. And the image that surely goodness and mercy shall follow us, is like we're coming back to his house. We're coming back to the huge mansion in heaven where the streets are of gold, it, it, to use this imagery a little bit. And it is the beautiful picture that it, we are being brought in to a final resting place. And that resting place is right there where God, the great shepherd, dwells. And it is this beautiful picture of his, of his protection, of his, the safety, and that, the security that we have. And matter of fact, in John 10, where we talked about earlier in the, in the series, he says, I am the good shepherd, but he also says this, I am the gate. So you see this picture of a gate. To get into the master's fold, to get into the master's place there at the homestead, you can, he's, John 10 talks about, there are people that try to sneak in. There are people that try to, you know, break their way in or earn their way in or find their way in. But there's only one way in to that final resting place, and that is through the gate. And the gate is Jesus himself. Now, it does say some weird stuff, like there are sheep you do not know about. And I believe that's talking about, to the Jews, he's talking about the Gentiles. But I want us to get this beautiful picture that the sheep are coming in safe and secure through the gate. And we'll be with him today and every day. But what does it tell us? I get that from a sheep's point of view, and I get it from the esoteric, we're going to heaven. But is that all there is to this? So let's look at three, phase, three phrases in this verse. I will dwell, go to the next slide there. Actually, I think that's it. Uh, 
I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Right? I will dwell. I love this beautiful picture, I. All through the psalm, it's been personal. It's been singular. He's been chosen. He, God is big enough, God, to be the shepherd for each and every one of us. No one is more important to him than the other. We are all his children. Some may have bigger jobs. Some may have, uh, you know, a little bit more in front of people. But we are all his children, and we are all special. And so, I will dwell. And literally, that means I will sit. So I'm going to come in and reside and hang out. I'm not just going to come in and stand up. All right? I'm not going to come in and just walk around and look at the house and then leave. I'm not a guest. I'm not a servant. When it says, I will dwell, he's talking to us almost family. Like the family we are, I will dwell. I will live with him. It will be my abode. I will, and I will, so I'll hang out here. I'm not just going to come and go. I am now part of the family of God. And Seth's baptism was a public proclamation that I, yeah, when my father baptized me, he didn't say, I baptize you, my son. He said, I baptize you, my brother. When I baptize my son, when I baptize my Calvin, not you, not that Calvin, but my Calvin, I baptize my brother. Because for all eternity, I'm going to know them, Seth, as my brother or my sister. So we come in and we dwell. We are not his possessions, not his hired hands, but we are his family. And only family dwells. Everybody else comes in, hangs out, and leaves. Where do we dwell? In the house of the Lord. Now this is very interesting because most of us think that in the Old Testament when it says house of the Lord, it's talking about the temple. And the great edifice, the great statue, uh, I'm not that statue, but the, the great, uh, you know, huge building with all the columns and the altars and the, and the holy of holy place and all that's going on. And David had that image in his mind because he gathered everything for that to be built. But to be honest, David, who wrote the psalm, never dwelt in the temple of God. It was his son Solomon who built it. So it's not talking the temple. It's not even talking, I don't think it's talking about a house or the tabernacle. Some kind of say this is talking about the tabernacle. It's not talking about all of that. So what does is, what is the house of the Lord mean? It means I'm going to hang out at God's place where he resides, his home. And interestingly, if you look at the next verse in the Psalms, not 23.7, it's not there, but 24.1, it says the earth is the Lord's and all that dwell therein. You want to know what the house of the Lord is? It's everything. It's not I'm waiting for a mansion to be dwelling with God. I am dwelling with God now. And it's almost like I'm not going to go to my mansion. And, and I, know, I know it does talk about I go to prepare a place for you. And I have, you know, we have a res res residence in the heavenly city. But it's almost like if all of this is God's, all we're doing is moving upstairs. <laughs> we're in the same house. So to be in the house of the Lord is to be in his presence. All of our life, all of this is his. Not just there. This is his too. Yes, we live in a world that is under a curse, or mankind is under a curse, and so it's a broken world. But part of his second coming is he's going to make all things anew. So when it says, I will dwell, I will dwell with him in his home. Wherever he is, I'm going to dwell. And so he leads me, he, and I'm going to be daily, and it's, going to be, and it's not just seasonal, but here I am, and I'm going to dwell with God. And how long? Forever. Now to be literal, again, let me, don't blow your world too much right here. The Hebrew does not say forever. Now, before you sit here and say, wait a minute, we're not going to dwell in heaven forever? Yes, we will. It says that enough other places. I came that, you know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. For whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. It, there's a whole other 
scriptures all out there that talk about turn, eternity. But in the Hebrew, there is a word for forever, and this is not it. This is actually two words, which means perpetuity of days, for all the days. Now, from a sheep's point of view, I'm back home. I'm going to be in my little, you know, my little gated community until the end of my days, however long that is. But David, I believe, is not only talking about to the end of this day, the life that we live, but for all of our days for eternity. I just want to get you to challenge here that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It is the, the, for all the, long, the length of all our days. There is this concept of time that we still struggle with. And I don't want to go too deep into that. But it is the point that he's saying, look, it's not just eternity I'm spending with heaven. It's today, too. And tomorrow. And in Hebrew, when it says the perpetuity or the length of days, it's talking about until the end of that season. Such as, you shall be their servant until you die. Well, or until the, ser- until the master dies. Or you, uh, there's other places it says that same phrase. So it is this point. Until the season ends where God is no longer my shepherd, I'm going to dwell with him. And the thing is, this thing keeps falling off. (laughs) The thing is, God is always going to be your shepherd. I just wanted you to kind of grasp this thing. Now, I challenge you with this. If you're waiting to live with him and for him in heaven, then you're missing a lot of what he has for you. Because he wants you to live with him and for him today. You're missing out on the, the one, the peace, the mercy, the fullness of his love. Because we are in his presence now. Now, I could stop right here, but this whole week, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to grab purple. Who's, I don't know who purple is. Who's purple? So I, I'll try not to mess it up too much. Um, and you can turn my thing off. Because I, not, I don't want to dwell with the eternity of that in my ear. All right. It's not that you couldn't hear me, but that thing just kept like a bug crawling all over my side of my face. And it was messing me up. I want to talk to you about a phrase that many of you may have seen, some of you may even understand it. But as I was looking at the whole Psalm 23, and I was looking at how does this impact my life, these two words just shattered me. It is the word quorum Deo. Okay? Now, it is Latin. This word appears in the Vulgate of translation of the Old Testament in one place in Scripture. And it deals in Psalm 56, 13, where it says, God, you have delivered my soul from death, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. And quorum day means, basically, before the face of God. We often translate it, in the presence of God. Of God. Now, this is huge. I want you to not just know this, I want you to live this. So, if I could wrap up the last 10 weeks with this concept and you walk out grabbing this, I truly believe your life will be different. Quorum Day is this practice of. Let me tell you a story about a man. He was born about the time of Cecil, 1612, okay? Um, He grew up, and he didn't know what he wanted to be. He joined the army, and at that time, uh, Germany was in a civil war, and it was a huge war. Over the half of the nation of Germany died during that war. And when Europe realized that everything, and really it was a religious war, Catholics versus Protestants, And in the end, it was really a power war, but that was part of it. In the end, he joined the army, he got shot, he got captured, was going to be hung as a a spy, he got off, no one really knows how, but
but he was released and sent back to his side. He got shot in the leg again. Um, and after the war was over, his life was never the same. And so he tried a lot of different things in his life. And finally, he decided, I'm going to go join a monastery. And he went to France, who at that point had become the major power in Europe because Germany had been decimated. And he joined a monastery. Now, he wasn't the brightest kid in the bunch. And in that day, you could become a monk if you were smart enough and get education and go forth. Or you could become just part of the order, and they would call you brother. And so we know him. He changed his name, and after he took his vows, we know him as Brother Lawrence. Now, some of y'all, I see from a few of y'all out there, you may have read his book, but he wrote, he never really wrote a book. The only thing that he got published by him was published after his death. It is a tiny little thing, my type of book. The only thing I don't like about it is there's not enough pictures. Okay, I like pictures. But it's called The Practice of the Presence of God. Quorum Dei. Not just knowing that God is around me, but that God is here and I practice His presence every single minute. Uh, practical way of doing this, uh, imagine that Gus is on a date, okay? And the first thing that his young girlfriend does is put a huge Bible between him and her. It's like huge family Bible with a picture of, you know, her dad on the cover. And it is a reminder that Hey, no matter where you and I go, Gus, God's here. Or to put it another way, don't do anything on a date you couldn't tell your mama about. Practicing the presence of God is living with such an awareness that no matter what I'm doing in life, I realize God is there. Now, Brother Lawrence not just realized God is there, because I think we all do that. Walk through the valley of shadow death, God's there. I'm in the hospital, God's there. I'm sitting in church, God's there. All right? I'm driving down the road and somebody cuts me off, God's there. We might even see little divine moments of guardian angelship, and we say, thank you, God, or, or all these different things. And, you know, you, you, you're, you, you, you go to the grocery store and the lines are 27 people long, and they open an aisle just for you. And, you know, God is there. You know, we, okay, I get all that. Good, bad, we get it. But the difference is Quorum Deo is not just that you know it, you live it. Now, Brother Lawrence had a huge job at the monastery. He was a dishwasher. Now, before you say that's really lowly, you try to go to, out to eat and they never wash the dishes. Get somebody's old dirty plate. So he was a dishwasher and he worked in the kitchen but he got this practice of constantly talking to God as if God was it, literally, his way of saying is, I try to live as if there is no one else in the world, no one but me and God. So I'll talk to him. It is to live one's, and, uh, and this is a definition of Quorum Dei, to live one's entire life in the presence of God under the authority of God, to the glory of God. This has become the accepted definition. R.C. Sproul uh, gave this quote years ago. But I want to focus, under the authority, I get it, we want to do what God tells us. To the glory of God, we're supposed to do that. But do you really live, do you really live like you're in the presence of God? So Brother Lawrence would just sit there and talk to him as if, an imaginary friend, if someone walked by, they would see Brother Lawrence having a conversation with no one there. Now, we kind of say that's kind of weird, but really that's prayer. So what it was, it wasn't prayer, it wasn't just I go to my closet, though he had those moments. It wasn't where I, I go and have my quiet time, though he had those moments. He, part of his duty was two things, wash dishes and pray. That was his job. So he had prayer. Later in life, when he couldn't stand anymore because of his leg injury, they put him on cobbler duty where he worked with shoes so he could sit while he worked. But still, prayer and all, during all of these things. So he'd be washing dishes and he would talk to God. Let me give you a few of his quotes. I think I have some quotes here, Lisa, up here. Um, I've got a few in, in my... 
I began to live if there were no one save God and me in the world. What would your life be like if life was like that? Instead of going down the street singing to music, which is okay, even if the radio wasn't on, the person next to you would see your lips moving. Hey, God. And God's not, first of all, this is my quote, not his. God's not your co-pilot. God's your pilot. Okay? Here's another quote. Um, One need not cry out very loud. Let me read it directly. One need not cry very loudly. He is nearer to us than we think. Sometimes we think God doesn't hear us all the way in heaven. Let me have a few that are not on the screen. We should establish ourselves in a sense of God's presence by continuously conversing with God. Alone, with, along with total abandonment, we must come complete acceptance of God's will and, and agree that he knows what he's doing. Here's a great one. Do not pray for relief from pain, but pray for strength to suffer with courage and humility. Now, I think this quote is up there. It is not the greatness of the work which matters to God, but the love with which it is done. It doesn't matter if I wash dishes. That's okay. When I was in my doctoral studies, one of my colleagues uh, worked for Duke University Hospital, and his job was to mop the floor at night. And here we are in our uh, a terminal degree studying biblical studies, uh, and this guy comes in class. He says, last night was weird. This, this old lady, I was mopping the floor outside the bathrooms, and the old lady walked by and says, young man, if you get an education, you wouldn't have to be doing that. He, says, he said, thank you, but the point is, whether you're cleaning toilets or building expensive cars, if you do it with the love of God, and that it's that important. We can do little things for God. I turn, he says, I turn the cake that is frying for the love of him. Here's a, I think this is a quote that's maybe up there. I may have taken it out. It is enough to pick up a straw off the ground for the love of God. So, the challenge, and we're going to follow up just real briefly with this, is to talk to God. Realize, if you know he's there, talk to him. Has anybody ever heard the word Bertha, uh, heard of the missionary Bertha Smith? Maybe some that have been around a while. Bertha Smith was a missionary in China for 40, 50 years. Godly work in the middle of, through the middle of the span of the communist takeover in the 1950s through World War II, and on and on and on. My father got to meet with her once, and they were out to eat. He said, this is a woman. Long before the War Room movie came out, Bertha Smith had a war room in her house. Literally, that's what she called it. Okay, it's kind of where that phrase came from, uh, if you know the movie. So Bertha Smith would be talking to my dad in the middle of dinner, and all of a sudden, just go, boom. Just hold her hand up, and then she would drop her fork, bow, and just start talking to God. And then pick her fork back up and say, now, where were we? The point is, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, who is the most important person to talk to? It's God. And if everyone around you thinks you're crazy, that's okay. Because you're living in the presence of God. So this week, tempted to do something? Talk to God like he's there. Because he is. Wake up in the morning and you just kind of go, and it's okay. Tell God, God, I do not want to get out from under these covers. It is way too comfortable, and I'm way too, I'm just, I want to live right here. As long as my husband will bring me coffee. That's what Lisa says. You know, I'll stay right under the covers. Just make him go get coffee. Live and talk, and it's if God is right along with you, and you will be a, it will transform your life. And for 20, about 35 years, he lived this. The first 10 years of his, uh, in the monastery, it wasn't. But for 25 years, he lived this. And people all over the city came to talk to Brother Lawrence because they knew he was that close to God. People would come to interview him, and he refused because he said, it's not about me. I just spend time with God. Practicing the presence of God is what it's all about. So start your day with it. Some people say, 
Set your alarm every 60 minutes. There are apps out there that you can get a Bible verse on your, on your phone every 60 minutes or every 45 minutes. And it just reminds you because during the day we have to recalibrate. We have to refocus and we have to get back and remind ourselves. So these, three point, these are the three points for today's sermon. Realize his presence, yes. Recalibrate reality. You've got to sometimes go, whoa, this is the most boring school class I've ever been in. So just start whispering to God. And if the teacher says, who are you talking to? Say, God. Okay? You don't have to talk out loud. But realize the reality is there. And realize it's not about religion. It's not where, okay, I've done my talk with God. And you check it off your list. You integrate it into everything. So if you're flipping a burger, do it with the love of God. You're turning on the whole nuclear power plant of B&W. Do it in the love of God. You teach 20 little brats called kindergartners, do it with the love of God. Your kid has not only pooped in his pants, but pooped all over the kitchen floor. Clean it up in the love of God. Talk to him, say, God, why did you make two-year-olds like this? Have you ever really wondered? We call him the terrible twos, God, and God will just look back at you and say, yeah, kind of like you, dude. You know, talk to God. Tempted, frustrated, sad, mourning, joyous. Share your life. He already knows it, but he wants you to share your life with him. Tell him your sorrows. Tell him your anger. Tell him your... Talk with him. Coram Deo. I have one last quote here. It's a little long but hopefully you can read it. Brother Lawrence says this, The king, full of mercy and goodness, very far from chastising me, embraces me with love. He makes me eat at his table. He serves me with his own hands. He gives me the keys of his treasures. He converses and delights himself with me incessantly. In a thousand and a thousand ways he does this and treats me in all respect as his favorite. It is thus I consider myself from time to time in his holy presence. If you think you come to church to be in the presence of God, you're missing it. If you think the presence of God and spending time with him is only that 20 minutes in the morning of quiet time, you're missing it. It is quorum Deo. Live your life before the very face of God. And that's what I believe the psalmist is saying. The Lord is my shepherd, and I will dwell in the very presence, in the very intimate, in the very infinite love of God forever to the end of of days, and when it comes to God and His children, there is no end of days. As, as the praise team makes their way back, I want to bring it back to Advent and hope. The change in Brother Lawrence's life was not a Damascus Road experience. It was not a uh, Martin Luther lightning striking and knocking him down. It was what he called not a spiritual revival, but a slow spiritual awakening. And it started with him, 10 years he'd been in the monastery, and he just was dead. He was lifeless. He was like, life is worthless, and I have no peace in anything. And then he looked at a tree. And unlike this tree, that tree, it was winter, it was barren, there was no fruit, there was no leaves, and he looked at the tree, and he just stared at it. And he shared the story, he says, this is where my life changed. I realized that life would come back to that tree, that the season of winter would be over, the leaves would return, the blossoms would give, and fruit would bear. My life may be going through that darkness of winter right now, 
one of the great things we say about Jesus in, in the time of December is the light has come, and we are realizing that not only the light of the world is the days are getting longer, but the light of the world in Jesus has come. But he said, there is, I look at this dead tree, and I see hope. Because I know it's grounded in dwelling in the roots and the word in God's creation. And I, as a child of God, have hope. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what, how good or bad or harsh or mean or sad or sorrow or, or joyous your life may be, but you might be going through a time of deep despair, and you need to know from week one of Advent, there is hope. He came the first time to make things right in our spiritual life. He will come again and set all things new. But we don't have to wait for, O come, O come, Emmanuel, eternity. We can say, O come, O come, Emmanuel, right here. Because Emmanuel means what? God with us. And that is the hope. Coram Deo. Live your life in the very presence of God. Give it all to him. And if you do that, if you practice that, you, re, you renew, you refocus, you revive, and just talk to him incessantly. I truly believe you do it out of wanting to get to know him more, your life will never be the same. Another thing of Martin, uh, Brother Lawrence said is if you get to know God, you'll want to get to know him more. So spend time with him. And I don't mean 10, 20 minutes a day. Every minute of every day he's there. If you need somebody to pray with, if you need to say, I just don't feel his presence, I'm down here to talk to you, to share with you, and to encourage you that God will never give up on you. If you feel like that God wants you to be part of this church family, this is a place where I encourage you to get involved, get connected. There are places. But most important, the only hope we have is not in the hope that we can turn things around. The only hope we have is in Jesus Christ. And if you don't know that hope, don't leave today without let us share with you what that hope really means, what the picture of baptism means in new life, in all that we've talked about today. O come, O come, Emmanuel, he is here in our presence. May we live like it. Would you stand as we sing this song? And I'm down here to pray if you need some help. Be strong.
strife and quarrel cease. Fill the whole world with heaven's peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to just a moment. David's got a short announcement, and I do want to encourage anybody who can be back this afternoon. To, uh, we're going to leave in just a second, but they're going to be playing some exit music, I believe. Got a, got a banjo and bass kind of jamboree going. They will now. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> All right, just a few things uh, for the youth. The MFUGE sign-ups, we still have four spots left. That's July 18th to 22nd is when that's happening this year. We still need one more leader. Um, and uh, we are still in need of sponsors for some who cannot afford to go. It's a $200 total cost. So there are four spots left for MFUGE. Uh, the Christmas party, which is on December 12th from 5 to 6.30, right over at the station. Um, if you're sending kids to that, they need to RSVP to Holly. Uh, there's dinner, and we're having a gift made for everyone who shows up. And then base camp is March 4th and 5th, and we also need you to let Holly know so we get everybody signed up, um, and that is $50. All that should be on the Facebook youth page, correct? Yes. Will be, if it's, uh, except for the numbers, except for the spots, okay. Uh, we are excited. Thank you for being here. Again, uh, would you stand? What were the two words? Anybody remember? Quorum? Deo. Let's live as if we're in the very presence of God. May God bless us as we leave this place knowing he is with us every step of the way. Go in peace to this music. Your